Hello and welcome to this NDTV special. We're out at sea on the eastern seaboard of India, right at the Bay of Bengal, to look at the International Fleet Review. This is only the second time that such a review is taking place. 50 countries, 21 naval chiefs, 4,000 sailors and almost 100 ships. But what you see right behind me in the distance, and I'm going to try and step out and get the camera to give you a clearer picture, is the biggest aircraft carrier that the Indian Navy has operated. That's, of course, the famous, the legendary Vikramaditya. And, of course, adjacent to it, right behind it, and we should be able to see it more clearly in a moment, is Virat, another aircraft carrier that will be decommissioned later this year and is perhaps on its final voyage. Now, over the next 60 minutes, we'll be bringing you a big exclusive, our town hall with the Navy chief, as he looks at maritime security and the preparedness of the Navy. Also, we'll be hearing the personal stories of sailors, cadets and officers, men and women who have made life out here at the sea and the pursuit of passion and adventure a lifelong commitment. me everywhere are ships, not just Indian ships, but also ships from multiple countries. The city, of course, playing host to the International Fleet Review. This is only the second time that we are seeing the International Fleet Review, which is going to bring together a host of countries, many Navy chiefs, and of course, the president reviewing this in a grand finale with the prime minister witness as well. We believe that this is the perfect setting to look at the state of our defense preparedness, maritime security, apprehensions of maritime terror, and of course, all the issues around defense procurement. And it is my honor and privilege to welcome on this Navy Town Hall, the Chief of Navy Staff, R.K. Dhawan. Thank you very much, Barakha. Delighted to be here. So for those who are not familiar with the Navy, who don't come from a military background, the provenance of the International Fleet Review is actually British. It was for the Queen or the King, the monarch, to review her or his naval fleet. In the Indian context, what is the significance about what we are about to witness? And why is it only the second time that we are actually seeing an International Fleet Review? Well, as you said, it's an old maritime tradition to have fleet reviews. And this is the 11th fleet review which started the first one being in 1953. We have a fleet review where the uh, Honorable President of India reviews the fleet once during his or her tenure. And the first one was reviewed in 1953. What you've said also is that this is the second international fleet That's review. Right. The first international fleet review was in 2001 of Mumbai, where we had 29 navies participating. And this time, it is the second international fleet review of the eastern seaboard in the city of Destiny, Vishakhapatnam, where 50 countries from the world over have got together at Vishakhapatnam to strengthen bridges of friendship. And 22 naval chiefs, I believe, 4,000 sailors from multiple countries, almost 100 ships, including our own, of course. That's right. It sounds pretty magnificent, but what's interesting is some of the countries that are present and some of the countries that are not present. So should we be surprised at all that Pakistan is not present? Well, as I said, that this is a review where a large number of navies from across the world are participating. We have the participation either as the chiefs, there are about 22 chiefs are there. We have, have about 26 heads of delegation, 24 warships from other navies are participating and the number of countries represented are about 50. The total number of ships which will be there in various activities of the review will be about 100, with 71 ships of the Indian Navy, 24 foreign warships, 
and we will have the Coast Guard, the Merchant Navy and the survey vessels also present there. And one of the ways that we display our maritime capabilities to the Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, which is the Honorable President, is by the Fleet Review. Yes, we have many countries present. Some of the countries are not present here. Um, Pakistan is not present, uh, but China is participating and uh, China is one of the countries which is sending its ships as well as the delegation. I want to talk about China in just a moment, but would it be fair to say that Pakistan is the only country that was invited and, did, and chose not to be part of this? Well, it's uh, something that... Pakistan uh, was invited, right? The aspect is that this is the inputs that we get from our missions, and it was based on that that uh, Pakistan did not participate. Talk a little bit about China. I find it absolutely fascinating, the Chinese presence here. And I think it would be fair to say that at the previous international fleet review, China was not present. That's right. So for the first time, we're actually seeing China here. And the reason it's so fascinating is uh, there is an impression that the fight in the waters today, in the Indian Ocean, is between India and China for the domination of these waters. So to see China here is interesting. How do we read this presence? Well, I would like to change that perception a little bit. I would like to say that the seas around us are gaining newfound importance as each day goes by. And there is no doubt that the current century is the century of the seas. The seas that you see out there, these are called the global commons. And the global commons mean that trade from one ocean flows into the other. And actually, it is quite different from the environment that you have on land or in the air. Mm. Because out at sea, when you have warships from another navy participating, they are all operating in international waters. If an officer of the watch were to report to the captain of a ship that we have a warship from another navy on the starboard bow, he would just tell him, son, flash to him, good morning because he's in international waters and so are you. The fact is that these are international waters we operate in and the aspect related to the safety, stability and the security of the global commons as we call them is a collective responsibility of the coastal states because no single navy, however robust it may be, can ensure the security of global commons on its own. So the medium of the seas actually lends itself for cooperation. And as we have seen in our waters, the Indian Navy actually has had a maritime cooperation roadmap for the next 10 years with all the countries of the Indian Ocean region literals. And this is in keeping with the vision of our Honorable Prime Minister, which is Sagar, which is security and growth for all in the region. So what you see all the ships out there, it is about cooperation, it is how to interact with each other and how to work together to make the global commons safe and secure. I will come to the Prime Minister's look east uh, policy and his emphasis, uh, his renewed emphasis I would say on the Navy in a moment. Uh, but sir, I understand that you have to give me the politically correct answer, you're playing host to the Chinese, but it's my job to be contrarian on this program, so I'm going to ask you the slightly awkward question. Yes, I understand that international waters are nobody's property. But the fact is that from a point, from a strategic point of view, Ch the Chinese investment, for example, in the Gwadar port in Pakistan, uh, in a port in Sri Lanka, which the, the, the conflict in the South China Sea, the battle for domination of the Indian Ocean, is it not a concern for India? Do we not have to provide a countervailing narrative to dominating these waters? Are we not, are we not seeing China today as a main threat of the waters and not the old enemies like Pakistan? A large amount of China's trade and China's oil passes through the Indian Ocean region. The Indian Ocean region actually has become the world's center of gravity in the maritime domain because 66% of the world's oil, 50% of the world's container traffic, 33% of the world's cargo traffic passes through these waters. And it is also a fact that 80% of the trade and oil that emanates in the Indian Ocean region hmm. is extra-regional in nature. Which what means is extra-regional? Extra-regional means that it goes out of the Indian Ocean region towards the Pacific and towards the Atlantic. Any impediment in the free flow of trade or oil in that region would have a detrimental impact not just on the economies of the region but on the global economies as well. 
and therefore there is so much of interest in the Indian Ocean region and we have warships from a large number of navies which operate in the Indian Ocean region. China operates its warship since 2008. The first anti-piracy escort force came in 2008 as part of the anti-piracy patrol which they do in the yeah. Gulf of Aden. Currently they have the 22nd anti-piracy escort force in place. Hmm. Now as far as India is concerned, we have vast maritime interests which have a vital relationship with our nation's economic growth. Hmm. So the Indian Navy monitors every movement of every warship and indeed other what we call white shipping traffic in our area to get an adequate maritime domain awareness. So the movement and the of the Chinese warships and indeed the Chinese submarines are also monitored by the Indian Navy. I'm glad you brought that up because in the media we see reports of these Chinese submarines, uh, you know, actually moving into Karachi, uh, moving into Sri Lanka, not permanently, but certainly transiting through. Is this a is this a point of concern? Well, it's an aspect that certainly that the Indian Navy monitors to see who is deployed in the region, where they are going, and what they are doing. As indeed we monitor the activities of the other navies as well, and also to get. The main purpose is to have a comprehensive maritime domain awareness in our waters because we want to know what is going on in the waters around us so that we can adequately protect our maritime interests. You know, there's a sense that, of course, China is not an ally and that the world is fighting a proxy battle or large parts of the world are fighting a proxy battle with China through India. So there's a suggestion that countries like Japan, countries like Vietnam would certainly like to see a stronger... Uh, Indian maritime presence to take on China. Do we see our role as that? Do we see China as our biggest competitor in the waters? We need a strong Indian Navy. We need a strong maritime force to look after India's maritime interests, which are huge. We have a long coastline of 7,615 kilometers. We have an exclusive economic zone of over 2 million square kilometers. We have island territories. 90% of our trade is by by sea. So these are all our maritime interests. So what the Indian Navy does is that we work towards shaping a favorable maritime environment in the region. And we have interaction with the other littorals. We have the interaction with Maldives, Seychelles, Mauritius, with the east coast of African countries, countries in Southeast Asia, countries in the Bay of Bengal, which is the largest bay in the world. And we also have interactions with China. I would like to mention that because our ships have visited China. They were there for the Western Pacific Naval Symposium. They were there for the joint exercises which were held there. Two of their ships had visited Vishakhapatnam two years ago. So you're not concerned about their investment in a Pakistani port? Well, if the investment is there in a Pakistani port, we have to see what that investment is for and what we have to do with our interests in the Indian Ocean region. Because the aspect is that the Indian Navy as part of the Maritime Cooperation Roadmap also looks at aspects related to capacity building and capability enhancement of the other island nations in the region. So we have to look and safeguard our maritime interests and closely monitor what happens in the waters around us. You have spoken about maritime terror uh, being a serious concern and we, none of us can forget what happened with 2611 and the Mumbai attacks. How seriously do you assess maritime terror and the dangers from it. I ask this because every now and then you read renewed threats from terror groups like the lashkar e taiba talking about a maritime wing. Well, first of all, it's important to understand that the in the 21st century, the challenges in the maritime domain are as wide and varied as they come. Hmm. Firstly, who could have imagined in the 21st century, we would once again be grappling with piracies. Mm. or that the major threat in the maritime domain, as you said, is from asymmetric warfare and maritime yeah. terrorism. Yeah. So in the last few years, there has been a host of initiatives and activities which have been carried out. Mm. Firstly, we have about 87 automatic identification systems, the chain which has been set all along the coast of India. The second aspect is that we have coastal radar stations, about 46 of them, along the coast and in the islands, which have also been integrated and operational. As you're aware, the Navy has set up the IMAC 
and the NC3I, the National Command Control Communication and Information Network, in which 51 stations, 30 of the Coast Guard, 21 of the Navy, have been integrated. All this is to provide a comprehensive maritime domain awareness in the waters around us. But this is leveraging technology. Exactly. What the Navy has all, and the Coast Guard have also done is that we have physically sent our people on foot, on motorcycles, in whatever means available, to every single coastal village with the aim of carrying out what we call coastal mapping. They have then spoken to these people and to bring out two aspects, mm. that they are an important part of the eyes and ears of the coastal surveillance. And this has had some great results because the fishermen now understand the importance of the terrorism and the other threats that are there. And also the fact that they are now getting themselves registered. The registration process is nearly 80% complete in all our nine coastal states. We have about 250,000 fishing boats. So depending, each state is carrying out the registration, but the levels of satisfaction are 70 upwards, 70, 80, maybe even 90 in some states. The aspect of registration of every fisherman is also being done. We have about 4 million as a fishing community. So that is also being carried out. But you know, sir, when we look back at 2611, you've spoken about how the Navy realized it had to reorient the role of the Marine Commandos, the Marcos, after what happened during the Mumbai attacks where, you know, it was, it was suggested that they could have done better and they did not. And you actually suggested that that was not their role at all. Now, how do you see that? How do you see the role of Marine Commandos in anti-terror operations? And I ask this because at this fleet review, I was seeing some of the rehearsals and the pictures that have come out. And I saw very, very dramatic images of this underwater explosion. You've got these commandos coming onto the beach. They're armed and it all happens within two, three minutes. So talk a little bit about anti-terrorism strategy and how you see the Marine Commandos fitting into that, especially after the mistakes of 2611. Well, the aspect is that the Marine Commandos are our special forces and they certainly have a role. But I would like to go one step backwards and say that when we are talking about coastal security or when we are talking of offshore security, it is the role of a large number of agencies that operate in the maritime domain. The change that has taken place after 2611 is that all these 16 odd uh, various agencies have been brought together on the same platform. So there is a fair amount of, of integration now. Because we have coastal security excises, which are held off all our nine coastal states and island territories. Every agency participates. And we have also carried out what we call as trigger operations. And we have launched in the last year itself, there'll be 40 or 50 of these operations. Each time we get an input, we go up in a higher level of alert and various agencies then coordinate. The Marine Commandos have a role to play. Let me say that when our ships are deployed for anti-piracy patrol, we have Marine Commandos on board. When the ship is carrying out a regular patrol, then a situation could develop and they can take on. In an anti-terrorist kind of a situation, they are trained for that. So that if there is a situation where there is a terrorism situation, our Marine Commandos, which is a highly specialized force with the correct kind of equipment, can that get involved to deal with the situation. Are you suggesting, therefore, that their role was never urban terrorism? You know, that, that Mumbai was not the setting for the Marcos? That was not, at that point in time, that was not the setting. But here now, they have been integrated into the larger setting aspect related to the coastal and offshore security. And if the setting or the situation and the, is such, then certainly they'll have a role to play. But I would actually like to allude to the role of various agencies who are actually patrolling the seas 24-7. We have our Dornier aircraft, we have the larger maritime patrol aircraft, we have our UAVs which are carrying out surveillance. We have our ships, the bigger ships and the smaller ships out on patrol. The Coast Guard helicopters, ships are on patrol. The local marine police is in patrol, much closer to the coast. And that is how this integration has been carried out. We look at these waters and it's majestic and it's beautiful and, and you know, we can see aircraft in the sky. Talk a little bit about what we're seeing up there, actually. Well, well I can if say... If our cameras can get that, actually, well, yeah. Well, uh, I can say that it's just on cue. Yes. Because if you're trying to say that, you know, our coasts seem unguarded, <laughs> there are many eyes in the sky uh, which are watching what is going on. 
and I mentioned the complete coastal surveillance equipment in terms of the AIS chain, in terms of the coastal radar stations, in terms of, as I said, the UAVs, aircraft, ships. Around this particular anchorage, there are at least three or four rings of security which have been put in place. So I'm glad you said that because I was going to say that when I look out at these waters, I'm thinking could an Ajmal Kasab and nine terrorists still come in on a boat and who would know? You know, because that's what a civilian looking at, at this expanse of, 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 of sea, of bay, or, you know, the Bay of Bengal is going to think. So, so I would like to assure you and I would like to assure the citizens of our great country that all aspects of security, not just for the review, but in our coastal areas, in our coastline is taken into account. Actually, our men and women ashore and when, uh, men out at sea spend sleepless nights so that our citizens ashore can sleep in peace. So there's a fair amount of surveillance that ca gets carried out and each time there is even a whiff of danger, we go up in states and deploy additional aircraft or ships as the case be in accordance with the standing operating procedure. Is there any gap in coastal security that worries you? And I ask you this because, you know, I was reading about uh, in Mumbai, there's the Bandra Worli Sea Link. And there are media reports that suggest that when you look out at the Bandra, Bandra Worli Sea Link, you know, there's, there, there are reports of a shack, of a shack that's manned by two coastal police officers. And the suggestion is that this cannot be your first tier of defense. So one still reads these reports, and I'm asking you if there's any gap you believe that needs to be filled, that needs to be plugged, that hasn't been yet. Well, uh, just to, uh, you know, clear that aspect, the first tier is not on land. The first tier is out at sea because the threat which we are looking at is not the threat which emanates from land. That is being looked at by other agencies. So the Navy and the Coast Guard deploy itself miles away, way beyond what our normal citizens can actually see. It is our ships, it is our aircraft, it is our UAV which carry out the aerial surveillance. I mentioned to you these various centers which are set up. They are the Joint Operational Control Centers. All the inputs are coming to them in the central areas and these are being monitored. We also have systems by which smaller patrol craft, the fast attack crafts, also go out to sea. I would like to mention, you mentioned what is further. What we are in the process of doing is that each of the 250,000 fishing boats will actually have a transponder. This How many will, of them have it right now? It is, it, the, the trials have been completed and state-wise in Gujarat and Tamil Nadu, they are being fitted now. So this is something which will ensure the further improvement of our coastal security. Let me ask you this. Uh, there, is, there is a concern about modernization. There is a concern about the slow pace of procurement. And there is a suggestion that nothing bogs down procurement more than bureaucracy. And I ask you this because your predecessor, who actually resigned after a spate of, you know, mishaps, uh, the Sindhu Rakshak being the prime among them, he famously told our channel that even to order a set of new batteries is, is a nightmare. And being the chief is not only about preening at parades, I'm quoting him verbatim. He sounded extremely angry about the bureaucracy and said even a set of batteries is a problem. I'm sure as a serving chief you can't be as blunt, he said this after he'd quit. But is the bureaucracy and is the slow pace of procurement a problem? And is it really that difficult? Because that sounds frightening. See, the aspect is that we have to understand what is required for the Navy, both in the long term as well as the short term. And as you're fully aware, this is dealt with in different sections. We could be talking about capital procurement, which is what the Navy needs tomorrow. That is not done ad hoc. It is done in accordance with a well-conceived plan. The Navy has a maritime capability perspective plan for the next 15 years. So the aspects related to procurement and procurement procedures, if I may say so, have actually got well streamlined in the past few years because the defense procurement procedure actually has been through a series of iterations. And as we speak, there is a new one which is going to be uh, released shortly. All these changes are being done by the Ministry of Defence in consultation with the services is to ensure that the procedures are streamlined 
so as to speed up, as you say, the pace of procurement. But even you have spoken about the need to expedite. Yes. So clearly there is a concern that it's not moving at the pace it should. So the whatever the aspect related to our suggestions to expedite the processes are given by the service headquarters in consultation with the Ministry of Defence and that is what leads, as I said, to tweaking of the defence procurement procedure so that the next iteration is a little more streamlined and speeds up the process further. The Honourable Defence Minister actually has taken this very strongly and he's very keen that the entire process needs to be speeded up. The other aspect which you mentioned is the aspect about revenue procurement. Yes. Because that is things that we need to run the Navy. Yeah. And those are aspects related to the spares, etc., which are there. And the procedures for that are actually under the delegated powers, which now under the new procedure that has been uh, announced, the powers of the service headquarters for uh, revenue procurement have actually gone up many fold than they were there before. You have spoken about this being a building navy rather than a buying navy. But the fact of the matter is that if you look at, you know, if you look at the whole concept of float, move and fight, then there is a sense that at least in the fighting department, uh, you are, I think, dependent heavily on imports. Would you, would you concede that that is a problem, that that creates a dependency and how do you plan to change that? Well, the Navy has planned to change that, not now, but some years ago. I know, but we have, we, I think if I'm not wrong, 70% of the, of the combat um, material is still dependent on imports. Well, that, that is a general statement. Let me amplify specifically as far as the Navy is concerned. As you know, the Navy has its own design directorate for ships and submarines, and this was the ship design directorate was set up over 50 years ago. We made our first indigenous uh, patrol vessel in 1961. And since then, there has been a focus on self-reliance and indigenization. Today, it's a matter of great pride for the Navy that all our current warships and submarines under construction, all 46 of them, are being built in Indian shipyards, both public and private. In the float segment, you're fully aware that we are 90% and above uh, indigenous because the warship grade steel has been developed by DRDO mm. and is made in country by sale and other uh, industries. In the move component, which is our machinery and auxiliary and the other main propulsion. It's about 40%? No, we are about 60%, 60% because the figures okay. are changing. Okay. And there are a large number of these uh, propulsion machinery which is being made in country in collaboration. Okay. Let me now tell you in the fight component, what is made in India for warships? Aspects of our radar, the sonar, communication systems, electronic warfare systems, our surface-to-surface -surface missiles like BrahMos, the surface-to-air missile, which is now the LRSAM, which is in collaboration, which recently did a successful firing. Aspects of our combat management system are all indigenous. Let me also take, because the level of fight component in different ships varies. The la latest ship that we inducted into the Indian Navy, INS Kadmat, yeah. which is an anti-submarine warfare corvette built in Garden Reach in Kolkata, is 90% indigenous, including the fight component. So, the point I'm trying to make is that, yes, we need to focus on the fight component, but there is progress. So, what has the Navy done about it? We have done two things. Firstly, we have outlined a science and technology roadmap in consultation with the DRDO for the next 15 years. This, I think, is a landmark document because now the Navy and the DRDO, which have always been working together, have a much clearer idea of the fight component, weapon and sensors which we need. Second aspect, the Navy has outlined an indigenization plan for the next 15 years and shared it with the Indian industry because earlier the industry was not very clear as to what we want to be indigenized. So that has been done. So these are measures to make sure that even in the fight component, the level of indigenization would increase in the years to come. So I'm hearing you say that you, you now see a big role for private players. In the past, there has been this resistance to allow private players into defense. And you're actually saying times have changed. We need private players to become indigenous. Well, I think uh, this is well known by the uh, government's Make in India policy which has changed all that 
and given a much bigger role to the private industry, including in defense. And that is a, a welcome change because now we have the opportunity where the industrial capability of the country in the defense sector can also be utilized for naval systems, for naval weapons and sensors. And this is a recent change that we've seen. And of course, it is a change which will result in us being competitive and also resulting in a price discovery. What would you identify as the biggest challenge to maritime, India's maritime security today? To India's maritime security at this point in time is that we need to firstly shape a favorable maritime environment in the entire region. Because the threat today is from the asymmetric warfare, it is from maritime terrorism, we need to make sure that our island in the, of Andaman and Nicobar, in the Bay of Bengal, Lakshadweep, in the uh, Arabian Sea are safe. We need to make sure that all aspects of our trade, because 90% of our trade is by sea, and the seas are no longer a benign medium, because earlier the trade was relatively safe. Today, any innocuous fishing boat can be a source of threat. And therefore, there's a requirement to make sure that we safeguard our maritime frontiers, we safeguard our blue water operation. So the Navy needs to firstly operate out at sea to shape a favorable maritime environment. We have aspects like sea control, our submarines need to be involved in aspects of sea denial, and thereafter we need to look at aspects of coastal and offshore security. You know, when we saw your predecessor resigning after those uh, very unfortunate mishaps, you said you were going to put systems into place that this would not happen again. But at that time too, there was a lot of focus on submarine rescue vehicles. Then there was another accident and there was talk about torpedo rescue vehicles. How much have we really progressed on that front? I think we have progressed a lot because the first thing that we had to do was to make sure that we adhered to the standard operating procedures which had been laid down. Because the Navy is a highly technical and a professional service, and for any action out at sea, there is a standard operating procedure. Whenever you take a shortcut, whenever you don't follow safety procedures, accidents could happen. So we had to do two things. Firstly, we had to make sure that we carried out detailed safety audits of all our ships and submarines, and indeed our shore establishments and air stations as well. At the same time, we had to ensure that we do not curb the initiative of the commanding officers who need to take bold decisions out at sea. So you're suggesting that is what happened in the past and that is a partial explanation for why we suddenly saw a spate of mishaps that the commanding officers were not empowered? Well, it's, not, it's, it's a combination. It's not a single thing. It's not one Actually, but you must have looked wrong. at it and We've you must have identified it. a so couple of... So it's a series of things. Some okay. aspects are related to where the procedures have not been followed. Some aspects where the safeties have not been taken into account. Some aspects are material failures. Some aspects are somebody didn't take the right decision. Yes. So these are aspects all had to be taken into account and we had to tackle all of them on all fronts. What about the absence of the rescue vehicles? The absence of the rescue vehicle has been taken care of because they are already being ordered. In the meantime, to meet our current requirements... When do we think we'll get them? We'll get them now. They, the process is all complete of the acquisition. Now is the delivery period which has to be taken into account and they'll be there. Let me, let me ask you to talk a little bit about what many people believe is a new emphasis on the Navy and, you know, the Prime Minister's Look East policy. And many would say that this international fleet review uh, is also foreign policy by other means. So how would you see that? Well, I would say the, the focus is on maritime aspects. The focus of the new government and indeed the Honorable Prime Minister is on India as a maritime nation. And he has uh, a vision which, as I said, he has even outlined in something like Sagar, which is security and growth for all in the region. As far as the uh, fleet review is concerned, it is an aspect where the navies of the world are here, which is going to increase the aspect related to cooperation mutual cooperation and interoperability. It's going to increase the interactions between the navies and I think that's a very, very important aspect. That's what navies do. We show the flag, we have excises with other navies, 
to enhance cooperation between other navies and enhance interoperability. And this is going to be achieved by the International Fleet Review. It's being held on the east coast of India because the Bay of Bengal is the largest bay in the world. We have six countries along the bay which are contiguous nearly coastlines and these are our literal neighbours. And they all will have the opportunity and indeed are all here to participate in the review. Now, listening to you in rapt attention here, of course, are sailors and officers of the Navy, also NCC cadets. And, you know, I won't, I, I'm sure they're too scared to speak in front of their chief, but maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the heroes and heroines uh, that we have here. We have a team of, uh, of women uh, officers who are going to be the first women team to circumnavigate uh, the globe. So, so talk a little bit about that. Uh, 14 months ago, when Super Cyclone Hudud yes. hit the city of Vishakhapatnam, and I visited here within the first uh, 24 hours or 48 hours, this whole city was a devastation zone, and yeah. I'm not joking. The naval base alone lost 50,000 trees. 50,000 trees? Trees in the Navy base alone. Now, we had already planned the International Fleet Review, and it did certainly cast a shadow on the conduct of the International Fleet Review. But I must say that the word impossible does not exist in the dictionary of the men of the Navy and indeed of the East Naval Command. And all that you see seated before you are the heroes of the East Naval Command, the Navy and the Hudud. And a big round of applause for them, please. Because every officer, every sailor, every civilian, and indeed the entire naval community rose to the occasion and put back the Eastern Naval Command to its pristine glory. The next set of people we have here are the NCC cadets. As you know that they play a very, very important role because they are the future. They are the future people who are going to be in the Navy. They are the future who are going to be leaders of our country. And the Navy has had a program with them where we've taken out these cadets out to sea, including foreign countries, so that they can get an idea of what the Navy is all about, what the aspect related to our maritime challenges are, how the Navy operates. And I've told them that if they have the spirit of adventure in their hearts, and if they want to serve their country with pride, then a career in the Navy is a career for them. So big hand of applause for our NCC cadets here. And the last in this lot, as I said, are our heroes. Uh, these are the women officers who are the crew of Madhai. And they are actually uh, training under the able guidance of the commander there, who's been around the world, as you know, all by himself. And these uh, women officers are now being trained, so they, they will be the first Indian women crew to circumnavigate the earth. Fantastic. So please give them a big round of applause as well. Now, like these ladies to please stand up so that they can be identified. And Commander Dhonde as well. He's the skipper. He's the one who's a legend. And he's the one who's training them to go around the world. They will all be participating on board their sail ship Madhai as part of the review. This does bring me to, as I said, my favorite question. The Air Force has now said the women, women can be fighter pilots, I think, from 2017. When are we going to see women on warships? When are we going to see women getting permanent commission? When are we going to see women in combat? Well, uh, I've answered this question to you earlier, but I'll repeat. But I'm, hope, I'm hoping that yeah. I can change your mind every time I ask you the question a little bit and a little bit. First of all, I must acknowledge that women officers in the Navy are doing an outstanding job in the Navy in whichever field they've been deployed in. They are the best that we have and in whichever field, whether it's in logistics, whether it's in education, whether it's in law, whether it's in observers in aircraft, they are our observers, air traffic controllers, they are our observers on the P-8I, the long-range maritime patrol aircraft, and they are actually deployed on that aircraft for long hours. As you know, this is a change from what I mentioned to you earlier. The Navy has taken the proposal with the Ministry of Defense to allow women to fight, fly as uh, pilots of our maritime reconnaissance aircraft. So that is a big first and, 
and we are looking forward. What about combat and warships? So warships. I'm not going to fully clap till you give me a different answer. <laughs> well, that also we made some progress. We've had discussions, and actually the honourable Raksha Mantri has asked us to look at the aspect related to the facilities and the administrative requirements, which need to be made available on board warships, so that we can open up this sector also for women. As I mentioned to you then. We have nothing against that aspect. It is only a matter of time. And trust me, we would very much like to see women be on our warships when we are ready for it. So women on warships and women pilots, as soon as the ministry clears it? No, as soon as we are ready. And how soon will that be? Very soon. Broadly? Well, a few Before years. this year is over? We'll try. <laughs> Another two years? Maybe. Is that a realistic timeline? There is. In two years, could we see women of the Navy yes. on warships and, and, and all, as pilots? All going well. And, and with getting our requisite approvals from the Ministry of Defence and the government. And permanent commission? Permanent commission is there for women. I explained that to you last time. It is only in the selected area. I know. I'm talking there, about more areas. More areas. Yes, we are opening up more areas. We are certainly up, uh, opening up more areas and that will automatically happen. Should I push my luck and say combat? Well, when they go on board ships, that's combat, isn't it? So no roles are kind of yeah. off limits. The intention is not to exclude women from any role. But I must say that it is prudent that the Navy is ready for them. Because we would not like a situation where we open up a particular sector and for a variety of reasons, we are not ready. Because they are outstanding women and we would like them to perform with no holds barred in every sector. Well, let me just briefly ask you in the end, uh, we're going to look forward to some pretty fantastic things happening here. Uh, skydivers uh, and the person, the, the diver who, who reaches the ground first presents the Prime Minister a book. I mean, it, this sounds like a like a Hindi film. Well, it's it's not something that's not been done before. Uh, you're talking about the operational demonstration, which will happen just here as we see it. Really, right here. Yes. One of the reasons why uh, Vishakhapatnam and the Bay of Bengal was chosen is because of the depths of water, which allows our warships to come much closer to the shore as compared to the West Coast, so that we can carry out a meaningful operational demonstration. And the Honorable Prime Minister will be the chief guest on the 7th at Ramakrishna Beach here, where the entire might of the Navy, our ships, aircraft, marine commandos, skydivers, will all put up a show. And uh, yes, part of that show will also be, I'm sure that it will be an exhilarating performance for the people, the people of Vishakhapatnam, and for all our foreign friends uh, from foreign navies, and other navies and friendly navies who are here. Uh, they will be skydiving and the intention is that he will bring down the book. This is a book on the maritime heritage of India, where we have tried to put together the maritime heritage of the past 5,000 years, which is titled Maritime uh, Heritage of India. And in Hindi, it is called Hamari Samudri Virasat. And uh, this is going to be released by the Honourable Prime Minister. And absolutely a pleasure. Thank to you have very you much. On the special Navy Town and, Hall. And welcome to the International Free Tribune. Thank you very Thank much. You. We'll be taking a quick break. And on the other side, some of the personal stories of the sailors and officers and cadets here in a moment from now. Welcome back. You're watching our special Navy Town Hall coming to you right from the eastern board of India at the Bay of Bengal. We heard from the Navy chief and now let's hear from the officers and the sailors and the cadets who were listening to him so carefully. I'm of course uh, starting with the women who are going to circumnavigate the globe, the first uh, set of Indian women to do so. But let me first just try and get a sense of what made them actually join uh, the Navy to begin with. Where are you from? I'm from Dehradun. And uh, do you come from a military background? No. So what made you join the Navy and what makes you want to go around the globe? Uh, since I was a NCC cadet, so that inspired me to join Defence Forces and I tried for Army first and uh, after that I got into Navy. And uh, this dream to circumnavigate the globe, to be the first all-women crew to do so, where does this come from? Love of adventure. <laughs> that's, that's Seriously, uh, yeah. that is the only reason first of all. And the second thing is like uh, I sailed from my uh, childhood like around 12 years old. So I have the passion for sailing and then, uh, uh, I mean, from smaller boats to uh, big and then finally we uh, are dreaming for the circumnavigation. Are you scared at all? No, not at all. 
what about you? You're going to be part of the crew as well. Uh, is, how long will this circumnavigation take? Uh, we'll be starting somewhere around next year, August. So it'll take somewhere around odd five to six months, maybe. And it'll be just for four of you? Yes, four of us. How have, how have your families reacted to this? Uh, they have their doubts, but still they have confidence in us. But they're worried for you? Yes, they will be. Are you, are you facing a little bit of those questions? No, because uh, my mom, she knows everything in and about uh, the ocean. She uh, She's like a coach for uh, all NCC and SCC cadets at sea. Though my father is he's, uh, actually scared about it, but she's not. What about you? They are happy. They are happy that I'm doing something different. You're, of course, the guiding spirit, as it were, of this venture. You're not going to be sailing with, with the women. I would rather not sail with them. They, I, I think it will be nice if they sail on their own. Yep. And how are you training them? What is the training process involved? It's, uh, they did some courses, uh, basic theory courses for three weeks. And after that, it's been hands-on training, uh, practical, just sailing around, that's it. And maintaining the boat and repairing her and, and stuff like that. So you were the first uh, uh, Indian to actually circumnavigate the globe. What made you decide to do that? Nothing. I mean, the Navy was looking for a volunteer. And I liked the idea and I volunteered for it. I didn't know people sail solo around the world then. Once so you were solo, absolutely by yourself? Yeah. How was that experience? Were there moments of anxiety, fear, loneliness? All of that, yeah. All of that. And how did you cope with it? Well, I survived. I came back alive. So it's okay. I mean, it's, you, you go through those phases in, on land too. And you but on land, you're not alone. Uh, yes. So I think uh, sometimes it's easier to cope with it uh, alone. And when you're, on, when you're sailing, you've got enough uh, on your hands. You've got a lot of work to do. You're sailing the boat all the time. So you go through your mood swings and sometimes you're wondering whether you'll see the next morning. And uh, sometimes you're cursing yourself for being on the boat, for volunteering for such a thing. Sometimes you see weather like this and you say, well, I don't want to go back to land. Let me just uh, try and get some of the women here uh, on what made you join and what you're looking forward to. Uh, we heard the chief talk about a larger role, maybe women on warships, uh, women as pilots soon. So, uh, what, tell us a little bit about what you want to dream of doing. Uh, this is Lieutenant Shrishti Thakur. Uh, I am a logistics officer. I belong to Himachal Pradesh. Uh, my inspiration was that, uh, first of all, my mother, she wanted uh, my child, my daughter, should join the defense services. Yeah. So it's very wonderful for me and that I am in the Navy and I'm fulfilling her dream. And would you like women to have a bigger role? Yeah, of course. I would like myself to be a permanent commission and serve my India. It's, it's my India, it's, it's my pride to serve Fantastic. the nation. Fantastic. And you're a shooter as well, is that true? No, that's I'm... Oh, that's, that's you. Okay. See, Navy has given me many opportunities to uh, perform in uh, shooting championships and all. That has made me very confident to pick up arm at any time and just shoot at whatever is required. So I'm just waiting for an order to be given and participate in the combat role or anywhere deployed by the Navy. So you're saying that being a shooter trains has already given you the tools you need to be in combat? Definitely, ma'am. And you'd all like to see those doors opening very soon? Definitely, I'm right? hoping a very good opportunity for me ahead. And what about you? I'm uh, Lieutenant Commander Lakshmi, ma'am. I'm, I'm also a logistics officer. And the day I have joined Navy, I always had a dream to serve on board ship. So I am still looking forward for that. So if it comes, it is good for all. So, so all the women here want the warships to actually yeah, be course. opened up for them? Yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> Do you want to add to that? Definitely, ma'am. This is uh, Sub Lieutenant Sadhana. And uh, my dream to be in Navy is a bit different. I want to be a part of uh, the R&D team of uh, nuclear submarine because uh, I myself is a uh, nuclear background, uh, basically from M I mean MSc physics. So uh, I've already worked in TIFR. As you've mentioned that all of your civil friends would have asked you, why did you, uh, did you join Navy and a uh, lot of questions. When I was serving in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai, all my friends, colleagues, starting from my parents, they were like, why do you want to leave such a stable job? I said, this is not where I belong to. I can work more for my nation with the knowledge which I have. That's it. We'll close there. A big round of applause to all of you. More power to you. May you achieve all your dreams. And thank you so much for being part of this special Navy Town Hall coming to you right from the Bay of Bengal.